One of the great strengths of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House series is its warm, personal voice that invites readers to forge a personal connection with both Laura Ingalls, the fictional character, and Laura Ingalls Wilder, the writer. Like perhaps many of you who have enrolled in this class, I fell under her spell too. So as we launch the study of Wilder together, I'll begin with that personal connection I have with Laura Ingalls Wilder. Then, of course, we'll move far beyond it. I discovered Laura Ingalls Wilder when I was in fifth grade, when a neighbor told my mom about a Missouri author who wrote stories about the frontier. I think Pam would like those books, she said. A few days later, I found this book, Little Town on the Prairie in the children's section at the back shelves in the bookmobile that parked once a week about a mile and a half or two miles from my parents' acreage. I liked the book and decided to read the next one, where I found a passage that opened my world to all kinds of possibilities. Gather ye roses while ye may, Mary began, and she quoted the poem for Laura. Then as they walked on together in the rose-scented warm wind, she confided and talked of her studies in literature. I am planning to write a book someday, she said. Then she laughed. But I plan to teach school, and you are doing that for me, so maybe you will write the book. I write a book, Laura hooted. She said blithely. I'm going to be an all-made school teacher like Miss Wilder. Write your own book. This passage sent shivers up and down my spine because I knew that the real Laura Ingalls had gone on to write book after book after book. I was an already an aspiring writer myself by then and appreciated the irony of the scene, although I didn't know what the word irony meant at the time. I did appreciate the concept. And largely because of this passage, I talked my family into visiting Rocky Ridge Farm about 40 miles from our house in southern Missouri for the very first time on May 29, 1965. How can I be so sure of the date? Because by 1965, I was 11 then, I was serious enough about being a writer that I'd started keeping a diary. And on May 29, 1965, I wrote this very short sentence went to Wilder home. I kept the entry short because I was writing in a five-year diary and I only had four lines to describe the entire day. Yet despite the brevity of that journal entry, the visit to Wilder's farm left a lasting impression on me. It provided concrete evidence that someone from the Missouri Ozarks could publish a book. Or as my dad would say, even a hillbilly can write. After all, Wilder had been a farmer's wife before she wrote, and pictures like this one made her feel friendly and familiar. There she was, sitting at her kitchen table with her books, wearing a dress very much like the ones my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Mongar, always wore to class. I had a lot to learn about Wilder that went beyond the popular myths about her, much more about this later. But in the meantime, standing in Wilder's kitchen, as I am now at Rocky Ridge Farm, looking at her handwritten manuscripts, which were on display in the house during those years, and the manuscripts were written on tablets just like the ones I used in school, this gave me great hope. You didn't have to live in New York City to write a book and have it published. I can't say that Wilder alone inspired me to pursue a writing career. She wasn't the single source of my inspiration, but she influenced me, even when I set aside her books to read what I thought were more sophisticated novels like Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier or Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. Like Wilder, I got my start in journalism, writing for my junior high, high school, and college newspaper, and finally my hometown newspaper, the Springfield News Leader. When I was working at the Springfield News Leader, I went on assignment with the very photographer who had taken this photo of Laura Ingalls Wilder, the incomparable Betty Love. 
Her photographs illustrated several of my feature stories for the Springfield News Leader in the early 1970s. So I had a brush with Laura Ingalls Wilder. I knew someone who knew Wilder. I rediscovered Wilder's work when I moved to South Dakota in 1974 and exchanged the soft, drowsy Ozark sky that Wilder had loved so much for a seemingly endless sky that stretched over a flat and almost treeless prairie. Whatever had possessed me to move to South Dakota? I once again reached for the little house books and they taught me to embrace that big prairie sky and its subtle yet dramatic beauty. More importantly, however, her books began to teach me essential lessons about children's literature and the craft of writing. I came away with a new respect for Wilder, but not just as a writer of children's books, but as a writer with a capital W. We'll explore Wilder's reputation as a writer, her style, voice, and narrative vision throughout the coming semester, but I want to briefly mention two key aspects of Wilder's work right from the very beginning. These points relate to the craft of writing, but they also underscore Wilder's particular approach to storytelling. First, less is more. The real power and beauty of language reveal themselves through simplicity. Spare language has power and artistry, whether you're writing for children or adults. Look at this passage, for example. The farther they went into the West, the smaller they seemed, and the less they seemed to be going anywhere. The wind blew the grass always with the same endless rippling. The horse's feet and the wheels going over the grass made always the same sound. The jiggling of the board seat was always the same jiggling. Laura thought they might go on forever, yet always be in the same changeless place that would not even know they were there. Simply, directly, Wilder captures the vast expanse of the prairie and its ambivalence. Her strong, direct, deceptively simple vocabulary conveys that sense of power and defines the prairie itself. And point two, which also relates to this passage, setting is more than window dressing. What I mean by this is that Wilder viewed setting as an essential element in her fiction and her approach to storytelling. She sprang from a literary tradition in which setting shaped and sometimes determined character. We'll talk more about the role of realism in Wilder's fiction later in the semester. But as a writer of books for young readers, she set a new literary standard for historical realism in American children's literature. No one had done anything like it when her first book appeared in 1932. Her characters, their voices, and their stories sprang from the American frontier of the late 19th century. The setting is invaluable to that story. In fact, setting is so essential to Wilder's work that in some cases the setting becomes a central character in her work. Let's look at this passage. Sometimes in the night, half awake and cold, Laura half dreamed that the roof was scoured thin. Horribly, the great blizzard, large as the sky, bent over it and scoured with an enormous invisible cloth, round and round on the paper-thin roof, till a hole wore through, and squealing, chuckling, laughing a deep ha-ha, the blizzard whirled in. Barely in time to save herself, Laura jumped awake. Then she did not dare sleep again. She lay small and still in the dark, and all around her, the black darkness of night that had always been restful and kind to her was now a horror. She had never been afraid of the dark. I am not afraid of the dark, she said to herself over and over, but she felt that the dark would catch her with claws and teeth if it could hear her move or breathe. Inside the walls, under the roof where the nails were clumps of frost, even under the covers where she huddled, the dark was crouched and listening. That's a character, not simply a setting. This passage also hints at another aspect of Wilder's career that we'll discuss, the question of authorship. 
who really wrote the Little House books? What do we know about how these books were written? What's unusual about their publication and what isn't? What's especially interesting about Wilder's publication history is that what it reveals about the publication process strikes most people as, as very unusual, very different. And in many instances, that publication history remains a mystery to both scholars and writers. It's something we will explore much more fully as the semester continues. Examining Wilder's work and the history of her book's publication provides insight into the profession of writing, which we'll touch on a bit briefly in this semester as well. Revising, working with an editor, the harsh realities of the publishing world, which surprisingly haven't changed that much since the 1930s. As part of our readings on Wilder this semester, we'll examine the manuscripts, correspondence, and strategic examples of materials of her unpublished autobiography, Pioneer Girl. But in the meantime, I can say that these materials portray Wilder as a hard-working writer, that the reality of her writing life undermines the popular myth about her. Again, something we'll discuss much more fully. In the meantime, just one last thought. There are unexpected depths in Wilder's books and layer upon layer of meaning. But really that isn't so surprising. You find that in the books themselves, especially when Lara tells Mary, there are so many ways of seeing things and so many ways of saying them. <laughs>